Hey, folks. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, we will give folks a couple of minutes to join. And I will be on silent with my video off for a second or else it's like the first five minutes of show me what you got ends up being me randomly talking, so. I always get excited when former residents join. Uh, it's always lovely to see. It's lovely to see everyone's faces, but I always get so excited to see Diego and Wes here. Oh, it's wonderful. Good to be back. Yeah, good to see you. Mm -hmm. Likewise. And I like your background too, by the way. That's really cool. Thank you. Um, Wes, every time I think about Lisbon, I just think about Bacchiao being cod in Portuguese. Indeed, I know. Hopefully we can have some fresh uh, salted codfish. Yeah. And celebrate compute over data. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Okay. No, 
Oh, thanks for, yeah, Endra's went over. Okay. Yeah, we'll give folks probably, like, another, like, I would say, like, three, four minutes um, before we go ahead and get started. Um, if Endra's is over, give folks time to maybe, like, grab some more coffee, get excited, do some jumping jacks, you know. Awesome. Thank you, Carla. Jay's here. Hello. Hi. Hello, show me what you got. It's like all my favorite people in one room. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I see mostly residents here that will be presenting. Um, knowing that Endra's runs late or is running a little bit over, I'm just gonna kind of start with the logistics of how things go. Um, but folks who you know are here to watch and mentors who are here, thank you so much for being here. Uh, for my residents, we'll go in the order that the presentations are set in. Uh, there's two ways um, before you go. Either I can share my screen um, and kind of you could just tell me like next slide. If you are demoing something um, or if you would rather have control over that, just have the deck up um, and you can share your screen as well. Um, I'll ask everyone before that. All right. Sound good? Um, please don't... Uh, we have some folks that you know need to kind of go a little bit earlier and a little bit later because of timing um so i just ask on the resident side please don't uh like change what order you're going in during uh during the session does that sound good okay awesome Uh, can everyone see my screen? Wonderful. Uh, so welcome everyone who's here for Show Me What You Got Demo Day. Uh, and also welcome to everyone who is maybe in Singapore and watching this a couple hours later after it's posted. Really appreciate you all being here both uh, live and also the folks who are going to watch this async as well, which I know a lot of you will be. Uh, this cohort was our largest cohort ever, which is really exciting. Uh, we had 42 residents, which is wild, um, and about 25 folks attend Colo Week. So uh, today what we'll be doing is we'll be uh, just giving a brief overview of the program, as we always do, uh, some, and we'll be going through some projects. We have some really amazing projects for you. Uh, it's always great that you know, from my end, I get to see them from, I don't know what my project's gonna be, to, I think we could do this, to, 
What if we did all of the things to an actual, you know, minimal viable product, which is always exciting. These projects were done over a six week time period. Uh, the first uh, three weeks of that was actually spent really deep diving uh, into a lot of our major products here at Protocol Labs. That's IPFS, LibP2P, IPLD, and Filecoin. And then we had Colo Week where we transitioned kind of from that async traditional learning sense into projects. Uh, and one of the reasons we do this is so folks who are coming into the network really get to get their hands dirty with the code and kind of dig in um, and start making an impact you know, really early on in their work, which is absolutely amazing. And we get projects from all over the ecosystem, from network partner teams to uh, the IPFS stewards to folks who are doing projects uh, on something that maybe they won't have an opportunity to work on later, but is a really good thing to do cross-functionally. It's great to see these all come together and we've got some demos for you as well. Hey, Katie, could you uh, exit and reload? Because we just put the voting QR codes on the on the slide. So uh, exit and reload the, the slides. Sure. Just hit refresh on the browser for the... Uh. All right. I think you're muted. Uh, I shouldn't be. Uh, also up here, like Lindsay just said, uh, we get to vote. Voting is open for everyone. So please stay, um, watch, you know, all of these projects and demos and vote for your favorite. Vote for the one you think has the best name. Vote for the, uh, what you think has the largest impact, uh, or the greatest bug fix as well. Uh, so definitely do that. Uh, you can only vote once, but you know, very important and again residents mentors community members everyone is welcome to vote for uh different projects okay so just a quick overview of launchpad again uh it's a six-week onboarding program designed to train and develop uh technical talent uh across the protocol labs network we have folks here uh that are participating that are network partners we also have folks that you know, are working in, you know, the Endres working group or the Outer Core working group. Um, and our goal is to uh, scale uh, a lot of different projects, a lot of different technologies, um, as well as onboard folks into Web3 and build really strong um, cross team and cross working group bonds um, throughout the network as well. Uh, we were really lucky this cohort. We got to go to very sunny Palo Alto. Uh, so now what I'm going to go ahead and play this video. Let me just make sure that this audio will come through correctly. Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to go ahead and play this. <laughs>
lots of absolutely amazing learning during that Colo week, lots of connections that were made, uh, which is always great to see. Uh, and then shout out to uh, our Launchpad team that is here. Uh, so Hannah, Carla, Lindsay, our new cohort manager, Dave, our curriculum team as well, Marco and Anal, who do absolutely phenomenal work. Shout out to all of them. Um, and also shout out to the video production team for making this uh, for us. We had Jared out there for a couple days with us, which was great. And... And here we just have some kind of additional pictures. Again, lots of deep learning happening this week. Uh, Colo week is always a really intense week, but an absolutely wonderful week. Uh, and it really gives folks the tools to kind of transition over again from more of that, you know, curriculum based learning into that project based learning that uh, we now get to see the results of. So let's go ahead and get started with show me what you got. First up, we have Joao. Uh, Joao, would you like me to continue to share my screen or would you like to share your screen? Yeah, you can continue sharing your screen. That should be okay. You want to share? Right, your screen? So here we go. Uh, th my project is called Quick Solder. Uh, next slide. Which basically because Quick is a transport protocol for HTTP3. Saturn is the centralized content distribution network of Falcon, which is a team I'm working on. And it's using currently HTTP2. And Nginx, and basically one wanted to try something more interesting. Next slide. Uh, this is pretty much because like time of time first body is a is age magic for us. So like class in this value is more for us. And so it should be, should be a quick way for us to uh, make improvements on these on these fronts. And so it's hard to assess this. Next slide. So we started by benchmarking. Uh, this was like, like actually team effort, these parts, like basically different team members touch different points. And so we started benchmarking everything and making sure that the, the, the values we were looking for actually were actually possible. Uh, then we researched on the on the browser side because to, well, to add this HTTP connections, you need the browsers to actually initiate them correctly. And that was uh, a bit challenging in some, in, some, in some aspects. Then we had integration, and then we started monitoring everything and distinguishing between HTTP2 traffic and HTTP3 traffic. Next slide. So here's my demo. It's like the shortest ever. So there you go. There's a curl. There's a curl hitting Saturn on a particular uh, a C, a CID. Uh, and so there you go. It's HTTP3 as you can see on the first line. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, but not everything worked the way you expected. Uh, we didn't really get better to time first by, by performance, which is kind of unexpected. Actually, things are staying mostly the same for the metrics we care about, except for the uh, percentile, 50th percentile uh, times first byte, which actually dropped around, I would say, 20%, which is unexpected. You can see, like, on the on the chart there, there's like this um, the, the time series, the blue one. Uh, this is actually a ratio here between our, our times and, uh, and the IPFS gateways one. So it's it's more like here, more is better than so, so like the. <clears throat> So it dropped a bit, so that wasn't expected for us. We didn't really know why, why, why that was happening. Uh, next slide. And so there were a few like, conclusions we, we came up with. Uh, for, first one was that, uh, well, the implementation was looking correctly at least, but there could be some, some, some performance improvements that could be uh, done on, on Nginx's quick implementation, which is currently better level quality. As you can see like on the bottom right side, there's like a disclaimer there. But we actually checked the developers beforehand, and they're like, well, there are many people using this on, on production already, so it's it's probably should be okay. Uh, then we also consider that could be uh, there could be other network related confounding factors here because well, uh, most of the the web to web is is TCP optimized, whereas like quick uses UDP, so there could be other things at play here. Uh, well, more recently, we uh, we had a, a different take on this because I mean, this, this explanation were not were not good enough. Uh, there had to be something else, and so next slide. And so we we tried replacing the the SSL we ended up using uh, to go with to go with uh, a GP3 and actually which was uh, called boring SSL, 
And so we ended up going to back to OpenSSL and that actually improves our performance again. I mean, it didn't recover completely as, as, as at, at this moment, we're still like, but there's a, there's a noticeable improvement. So we're, we're still assessing this. Uh, and so like, you can see like, there's the, again, like the, the blue time series, there was like this, 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 this line there, uh, signed, signed by the first red arrow. That's where the deploy happened. Things dropped a bit. And then like on the fixed line, that's it's the next red arrow again. And so things like increased again. So, so yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, we're looking into this. So if anyone has any insights into HTTP three and possible <laughs> things that we could be looking into, we'd be glad to hear from you. That's it. All right, wonderful jo job, Joao, uh, and the entire Saturn team. Uh, Right after every presentation, we'll give folks, uh, you know, a couple of seconds to ask questions. Does anyone have any questions for Joao? Uh, All right, moving on. Uh, we now have the data onboarding website, a customized journey for clients who want to store on Filecoin. Awesome. Again, would you like to share your screen or would you like me to click through? Yeah, I want to share my screen given I have a well-framed demo. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Can you see my screen? Cool. Hey, everyone. Yeah, great to uh, be here. So today I want to walk you through um, the journey of building the data onboarding website, uh, specifically uh, the roadmap and also the well-framed demo. So let's first start with the objective of this website. So right now, the problem we continually seeing is uh, when people ask us where to store uh, our data on Filecoin uh, and how exactly do it, there is no best place to find those information. So the objective for this website is to really it's threefold. First, uh, uh, let people know why Filecoin, why it is a better solution than your current, like either centralized storage, public cloud, really showcase the cost benefit comparison uh, to, of Filecoin. And next uh, is to show the what and how. As a user, we want to lever, uh, help you to identify the right data onboarding tools and really attach a short, sweet video on how. So essentially, a very customized journey based on your needs. And lastly, we want to use this uh, website as an opportunity to build an open community. So anyone, if you want to store data on Filecoin, rather than let the uh, information silo in Slack, we wanted to uh, have an open forum so people could support each other uh, directly and essentially we might even have some data on board a wizard that uh, can help you in this journey. So with this objective in mind, uh, in the couple of weeks, uh, in this couple of weeks, uh, this is basically what I what I did so far. So initially, I uh, will work, work with some folks on our team, uh, the client growth team, to develop the uh, planning documentation, uh, essentially source the uh, content and as, uh, assess the content gap and really just see uh, what kind of information we could already leverage in the in the like either Filecoin uh, uh, IO, the main website. And now uh, uh, I'm at the wireframing and content review phase. So, uh, and I, I'm happy to show the wireframe demo uh, very quickly uh, later. The next step for this is to gather preliminary feedback for this website and really work with our customers, uh, clients, uh, some storage providers to get their uh, feedback while we are still developing the frame, uh, the mockup. And uh, and then like uh, aim for uh, October, I want to uh, work with our uh, web development team to actually code it, like develop the backend and test both internally and externally with a goal in mind that we want to ship it in the field Lisbon. So now uh, let's take a look at the wireframe uh, demo. In Let me open the Figma, hope it will work. Awesome. 
So here is the preliminary website. So as you can see here, as a, a potential user, a potential client, the first pair page you saw is uh, the key value prop of storing on Filecoin. Uh, with very uh, essentially, you know, we have verifiability, flexibility, cost-effective data flexibility. So it's no longer, you know, just a fancy kind of blockchain technology. It, you can really add this value to your business. This can really add value to your business. And 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 then you get to a like a a, we, we, a selection wizard, right? If you are enterprise, you click enterprise, and then you tell us how much data you want to store. And then like you might want to store uh, more than one tickbytes. Then what's your frequency, right? Retrieval frequency. If it's yearly, then we will also ask you like how many people want to access it and essentially recommend a product for you. Yeah, so that's the whole uh, uh, whole point to uh, customize your journey and really recommend the right product for you. So this website is still in development. Uh, so you can see uh, essentially we will keep adding, you know, the uh, more and more content involved uh, in terms of, you know, uh, work with the actual product owner for this those products and uh, have a short and sweet video to explain how to use it. And if you uh, want to get in touch with our like expert when you want to onboard a large data set, then uh, we will also uh, offer uh, solution architect help directly from this uh, website. So yeah, so that's pretty much. And also like I would love to, we would love to add like uh, proofs, social proofs and testimony from the organizations we are already working with to add the trust layer to our solution as well. So that's, yeah, that's all I have uh, so far and really excited to see how these things will uh, play out ne next month and eventually uh, get uh, more feedback once it's getting closer to, you know, the uh, more complete state. Thank you. Any questions? Awesome, thank you so much, Celine. Uh, and I also can't wait for next month's month as well. Next up, we have interplanetary specs. Uh, would, you, uh, would you like me to share my screen or would you like to share yours? Yeah, please, if we could share. Yeah, I got you. All right. Hey, hey everybody. Um, so nice to see everybody again, even if it's over Zoom. Uh, but this is the interplanetary specs project that Reed and I worked on. Um, next slide, please. So just to give you guys a quick uh, recap of what we're trying to address with our Launchpad project. Um, I'm on the libp2p team, Reed is on IPFS, and a lot of the work that uh, you know our teams do on a day-to-day -day basis involves uh, in writing specifications and writing the implementation according to specifications. So these specs, um, they're really critical and they only become more important as our ecosystem evolves, uh, as more organizations rely on uh, IPFS and libp 2 p to you know, build their stack. Uh, for example, ETH2 is, is you know, something that was six years in the making and now after the merge, they're you know, powering their entire networking with libp 2 p um, It's also really important because additional implementations get written in different languages. Uh, for instance, you know, libp 2 p has so many new ones being written every day in Swift, NIM, ZIG, uh, what have you. Uh, however, we're kind of in this uh, position where the current specifications don't meet critical needs uh, for a number of different reasons. So one of the things is um, the specifications themselves have inconsistent versioning or lifecycle management. So as a new user or someone who wants to consume the specs, uh, you know, if you're an implementer, it sometimes is unclear how much you can trust uh, a spec, even though it may be checked in into the repo. It's it's still not, uh, you know, upon reading, it's still not 100% clear. Um, specs across uh, organizations like IPFS or loop P2P, and you know, even within the within a single repo, they're not really standardized. So it 
it becomes more unclear in terms of gauging how comprehensive a, a specification is. Um, and then the specs themselves, right? The content that's within the specs themselves, even though they may be following different formats, those, those specs are also in like varying states of completion. So we, those are some of the issues. Like if we hope to you know, power the Web3 ecosystem with in libp2p and ipfs we also want to make sure that they're well specified so that people can rely on them uh, you know have a certain sense of accuracy and trust so there another another thing that we're hoping to address is like change management so we want to have a single place to record and track proposed changes um, and also introduce an inclusive process to triage and evaluate proposals to specifications that bring in the wider ecosystem so the ip stewards team does a great job of you know evaluating spec changes, but eventually we want to make sure that the wider community is also involved. Similar to you know how FIPS work today. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so um, I'll jump in uh, I, I, again. I'm Reed, uh, and so to the approach we've taken with this has been to really to kind of take a step back and look at like what is the ideal way that we want a spec repo to to look, we want the specs to look, we want things to be structured, and what is the process we want to evolve things moving forwards. And so those are the things that uh, we've really been focused on is getting those things in place. So first is defining a comprehensive spec versioning and lifecycle system. So this is a way for us as, as these specs are, uh, we, we got a lot of specs already out there, we got new specs coming in, and how do we track and make sure that we understand what's in draft, what's published, and things like that. Uh, second is we want to define a standard repo structure for the spec repositories that just enforces best practices. Um, not a lot more to say on that. Uh, third is create a base template uh, for the specification so that we're, we really define what a good specification looks like through that template. And then new specs that come in will pick up that template by default. And then we're also, as we'll talk about later, we need to go back through and take existing specs and move them over to this. And then finally, uh, as time goes on, the protocols are going to evolve and we want to have an orderly process that uh, involves all the relevant stakeholders to, uh, to, to consider changes and propose changes to these protocols and either approve or reject them eventually. Um, I want to call out we're not starting from scratch with a lot of this. So libp2p has a great start on a spec versioning and lifecycle system. We are taking it and evolving it somewhat, but it is a base uh, a baseline for us to go from. Similarly, IPFS recently started a uh, the IPIP interplanetary improvement process that's modeled off of what Filecoin is doing. And, uh, and similarly, we're taking this and starting to evolve that, uh, as we'll talk about in a minute. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this slide is talking about point number three, which is like a base template uh, for any new spec that gets introduced, whether it's in libp2p or in IPFS, something that can be extensible across uh, projects and across uh, repositories. What it really seeks to do is address concerns that have been raised by uh, IP stewards, engineers, um, and by the community. So like you'll see that I put in two issues. Some of these are open issues that have been around for a long time, but you know, we're hoping that by standardizing this specification, a newcomer or a new implementer can come in and say, okay, I know exactly what state the specification is at today. Um, and, you know, it kind of outlines a structure that is followed and repeated across other specifications. So you have a nice uniformity um, across uh, projects. And, you know, it also addresses some things that people have raised about like, adding a glossary maybe like, you know, there's new terms that get defined when you're writing new specifications for new protocols. And so you wanna also call those out. Um, really what we're hoping to do is make this, not just make the specifications, not only consumed by implementers or people who are really, you know, in, in, in the weeds with libp2p and, and IPFS, but also approachable to, to new people. So, you know, adding a glossary to the spec, something like that is, is going to be, you know, pretty welcomed uh, by the community. So this is just an example of something that we're going to do for point number three. Um, and we have others as well, but, you know, we'll, we'll get into that later. So next slide, please. So for the, uh, again, th this is the improvement process, the RFC process for specs. Um, so, and as, as I mentioned, we recently introduced this for IPFS. Um, 
one of the things that, that we've recently done as part of our project is documenting and proposing a set of changes to that process, which uh, really kind of builds a much more structured but still lightweight consensus process to ensure that proposals are fairly considered uh, with input from stakeholders and, and the rest of the ecosystem and just making sure that the wheels keep moving, right? So if you, if you propose something that you know that there is a certain window of time in which it will get considered and, and move through that process and either kind of given an up or down vote um, or, or feedback to modify. Um, so there's a lot of next steps for us in this process. So we want to take, uh, there's a bunch of pull requests currently against the uh, IPFS uh, specs uh, IPIP process. And so we want to triage those into the process and keep that moving. And, uh, and then setting up kind of the working group touch points that are called for in our proposed changes to the process. Uh, the next steps after that would be, uh, you know, as we kind of get things refined a, a bit on the IPFS side, moving this process over to live P2P and then exploring uh, what it means and whether it's needed to scale this to cover IPLD multi-formats and some of the other projects. Next slide, please. Yeah, so our next steps really, um is to work with our teams and the communities to commit to, to some of the processes that we've defined and you know the structure of the documentation. We really wanna make sure everybody's involved. Uh, Reed and I kind of have been working on this um, and we also really need to incorporate feedback from our team. So what you're seeing here is just you know um, our thoughts, but our next step is to involve a you know, much wider group of stakeholders. Uh, we're planning to build and you know drive the adherence to versioning to the templates uh, things that we've described above uh, identifying documents and you know deltas and changes across repositories and really lead the effort to you know make sure we triage things clean things within our respective teams uh, triaging the open issues that are open against either the IPIPs or the specs repos um, you know we've already started to begin begin doing this with um, you know our team leads uh, and then lastly, institute the RFC and change management process uh, in the respective communities. So like we mentioned before, something that's very inclusive that you know takes into uh, consideration what, what the community also thinks about this. Um, so that's it for our presentation. Um, any questions? All right, great job. Uh, really excited and, you know, love the idea of adding uh, adding in that glossary. I think that that is very well needed and will be wonderful and love the uh, collaboration across different projects as well. All right, next we have Rita uh, with the Community Events Playbook. I do see Rita here. Rita, would you like to present or would you, uh, is the Wi-Fi wi still a little wonky? All right, I am gonna go ahead. Oh, we got you. Can you hear me? I can hear can you, you hear yes. Me, maybe? Yeah, yes. it's still walking. If you could press play right there, please. I got you. Community Events Playbook, a step-by-step -step guide to planning an event that attracts the desired community. What are community events? Community events are gatherings that aim to bring together specific audiences in ways that enrich their knowledge and grow the community. How do I plan an event? This playbook will answer this question. Each event cycle will begin with a proposal, who, where, and why, a plan, how, execution, delivery, and the follow-up, next steps. In building the community events playbook, I started with our notion page the community events playbook starts by um, again defining community events and walking you through all phases of event planning from the pre-event planning stage right down to follow-up so we go pre-event planning um, establishing who is the driver who are the decision makers who are the contributors and what's the history of this event has this event happened before have we done this event before what were the schematics of the event what were the, the logistics and what were the results all of that information goes into your initial pre-planning process because this will help drive communication. This will help determine the planning process. This will help drive so many um, efforts in getting the desired results. From the pre-event planning stage, we go right into event planning, starting with proposal, what is the event location, format, time, date, 
all of those things, description of the event, all of those things get addressed during the initial proposal process. And the planning phase, phase two, or step two, is establishing communication channels, weekly planning calls, Slack channels, um, selecting a venue, looking at the research, the venue research database that we've newly established. Also set up the site visit checklist to help once a, a venue has been determined as um, a choice, the next step is to conduct the site visit to ensure that the venue actually meets our needs for the event. From the planning process, we go right into execution and delivery. That involves setting reminders, um, notifying your attendees, communication, communication, communication. Event execution is all about communication, whether it be your internal staff, vendors, sponsors, or your attendees, you can never under communicate. This section will get fleshed out a little bit more as we are always discovering new SOPs um, that work for each event. In the post event process, that's where we do our follow up. What are our attendees saying about the event? Was this event considered successful? Did we meet our KPIs of the event? All of that gets addressed in the post event process. And this would not be a playbook without having some additional resources uh, like our event brief, more event planning 101, as well as reviewing some of our past events. We always will link to past events so that one can see you know, what the tracks look like, what worked in Austin versus Toronto. These things will all be fleshed out in the community events playbook. Going back over to our slide deck, what are our next steps? Continuing to uncover more and more SOPs and continue the development of our Notion page. That is the community events playbook. Thank you for your time. Awesome. Uh, and Rita, shout out to you because I know you recorded this uh, at an event where, you know, the Wi-Fi was a little wonky. But uh, if anyone has any questions for Rita, feel free to type them in the chat or Slack her as well. Community. Thank you. Uh, all right. Next, we have Sankara with Decoupling Data Sets Explorer for Slingshot. Hi. Next slide, please. Ah, okay. So um, Dataset Explorer is just basically a portal for discovering and exploring datasets, open datasets that have been uploaded to the network through the Slingshot program. And at the moment, um, the current challenges that we have um, tracking all the uploaded datasets is not easy. Executing code on these data sets directly is also a challenge. It actually, that capability doesn't exist. And then very important is if you are a researcher or you wanted to consume these data sets, um, understanding their properties right now is, is a big challenge. Uh, retrieval is also a functionality that we would like to have on the portal that doesn't exist. And then finally, there is no mechanism to measure community engagement with the data sets. Uh, next slide. So uh, the proposed solution ideally is to rebrand Dataset Explorer, so decouple it or separate it from Slingshot and have it uh, evolve it into its own uh, product. And the idea is rebranding it, have um, probably just change uh, the logo, the URL, have it hosted as a separate service, um, as opposed to the way it is part of the Slingshot uh, uh, service right now. And then um, enhance it to a point where we are able to support active state on chain, as opposed to the archived data right now. And then there are minor UI enhancements that we intend to do, which will bring in the ability to filter data sets nicely um, using various properties from uh, uh, the car metadata. And then um, also bring in the aspect of discovering uh, discoverability by expo exposing more properties um, of the data sets. Um, the next thing we hope to achieve will be to build a mechanism to foster community engagement just collect feedback from people. What are guys saying about uh, particular data sets? What challenges um, somebody faced and things like those. 
then leverage uh, BitSwap um, to support retrieval and unloading of files directly from Dataset Explorer. So the idea here would be to have SPs run these as a service and then integrate it with the IPFS gateway and support retrieval of data sets. And then finally, integrating it with Bacleal to support remote execution of code on the data where it is stored. So the idea is if at some point, not if, because at some point it is, we're gonna look for ways to monetize it. It is gonna have much more value if somebody can execute code on the uh, stored data sets, even save the output of whatever it is that the analysis or whatever they would have been doing, if it is training an ML or something like that, save it back. So um, that's it. All right, wonderful. Next we have Ivan with indexing IPFS. Again, folks, uh, just hey, yeah, everyone. Vote, <laughs> for, vote for your projects along the way as well. Uh, but take it away, Ivan. Cool. So, okay, let me share. Okay, you can ask this screen share while other buddies can share. So, um, right, Katie, can you please let me share the screen? Should be good now. So, guess that's one. Okay, can you see it, guys? Uh, yep. Right, okay. So just to recap the problem um, that um, IPFS nodes, they use the DHT for content routing, which is decentralized, but can be slow to propagate the requests. Uh, updates through requires multiple hopes to find like a single piece con uh, of content on the IPFS and uh, just generally can be slow. So Filecoin uh, uh, can in the same time benefit from faster lookups by line indexes, which are really fast to find the providers that have a certain piece of content. So recently, as I mentioned on the uh, uh, all hands before, IPFS um, uh, introduced reframe protocol, which basically allows IPFS nodes, nodes to delegate the all the uh, routing to some external system. So now IPFS nodes, uh, now basically those who are running the nodes can decide by themselves like how they want to advertise their contents. And what it allows us to do, it allows us to um, connect to the to the Kubo node via reframe protocol and uh, capture all the data that this APFN, APFS node has and advertise it uh, out to the, to the indexes. And then through these indexes, uh, people will be able to find this content uh, on the IPFS nodes. So IPFS nodes, IPFS content can be available alongside the Filecoin content too. So um, uh, I will show uh, the demo in a minute and uh, just basically um, yeah, just want, want to discuss the uh, on the next stop first. So first of all, like Kubo, uh, it's a reframe is at a very early stage at the moment. So only uh, the release candidate one uh, has been cut today that actually supports it. So support is very, very, uh, it's really early days. So uh, we can start uh, trialing the indexing of IPFS on smaller nodes, uh, on smaller nodes of IPFS cluster that's managed by protocol labs. Uh, and then like once this is proven to be successful, once we polish the box on both the Kubo and uh, indexer side, we can work with the IPFS steward team on having PL, uh, PL run IPFS cluster to provide index to, to us, to us meaning to, to the indexes. So yeah, and now let me try to show you the demo. So, and just bear with me, I'm showing this live, nothing is pre-recorded and Kubo is, as I mentioned, uh, using the forked version. So it might be a bit fragile, but I hope everything works. So I'm running three things currently. So at the left uh, bottom uh, part of my screen is the Kubo node that I had to tweak a little bit to start supporting uh, reframe properly, which is not supported, so now supported in uh, release candidate one. So above it is the indexer that I'm running locally. So where we can, they basically that's gonna provide us with the information about where the content can be found. And uh, to the right of the indexer, I'm running the index provider. This is basically kind of the bridge uh, between the Kuba nodes and the 
and the index itself. So I also do have the uh, browser window open that is pointing to my local Kubernetes. So I can, let me try to open the text editor. So I don't know, hello, bunch of people, save it to desktop. Then I go and try to input in this file. So once I imported it, you see, so it started capturing different things. So basically index provider received advertisement from the APFS node and then advertise it back to the indexes. So now what I can do, I can take the CAD of the apported file, copy CAD, go here and use the index uh, uh, command line to find this CAD, hopefully. So find, so yeah, and basically, and then it shows that, okay, where this content can be found. So, and this also works with more complex uh, uh, pieces of content. So for example, I uploaded the, some zip file of uh, item two, which is 23 megabytes. So I can go to the inside. It consists of a lot of chunks. So I can take a sub chunk of it, for example, and try to find details about it. So it also shows up. Uh, yeah, so, and basically, that concludes my demo. All right, excellent. Uh, always, I know, nerve wracking when you are live demoing, but went off without a hitch, which is great. And next up, we have, I lost my bliss, Ravi and Dave, uh, who will be talking about heterodex searching for Web3. Hi, everybody. Um, great presentation so far. Uh, Ravi and I are going to be doing something a little bit different from uh, Ivan's there. Um, the goals of our goal of our project, and uh, we can move to, oh, sorry, I'm on. Oh, Katie, do you want to go back to sharing your screen? Or... Thank you. Cool. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we had two goals here. Um, we're going to get into this in the, in the next slide in a second, but uh, as you've probably all heard in the last few weeks, there's been record high interest in opportunities within the PL network. And um, Ravi and I began discussing the channels in which PL accesses um, candidates and um, decided that it might be helpful to create a tool where um, recruiting team uh, members can click and find um, candidates through new means or new channels. And um, if we go to the next slide, we'll just build on that slightly. So the current state, um, I think August was the record high number of um, applicants uh, into the PL network. And uh, the prediction shared by Ian was that uh, September is going to surpass that. Um, and so Ravi and I really focused on the idea that in Web3 and um, there are a lot of talented individuals who exist outside sort of the traditional um, hiring avenues. And uh, the question that, that we posed as um, working through this was how best can um, PL access the periphery where a community of these potential candidates reside? Um, and Ravi's going to um, take over here to explain a little bit about this chart and um, a bit more on what we did over the past few weeks. Ravi, you're muted. Ravi, are you there? Sorry, I didn't realize I was mute. Oh, yeah. Sorry. There you are. As you can see from the graph, like applicants are surpassing any other domain and applicants are good, but majority, like if you see the percentage of qualified applicants is really low. Katie, if you can go to the next slide, please. So like, how do we find the best talent for us? And we really wanted to challenge ourselves to think outside, as uh, Dave said, the traditional channel, be it LinkedIn or applicants. There are numerous channels available out there. Uh, so we set a target that we are gonna at least find 30 channels. As of now, we have completed nine different channels to find candidates, uh, starting from Kaggle. Like this is where we came into, uh, uh, this is where we basically learn about the custom search engines, which is these days called the programmable search engine to find these talents uh, for any open role within PL or PL network. To start with, we started playing with Kaggle. Like there are a lot of competitions going on. There are a lot of discussion, which 
that is not of uh, interest to us. We are rather interested in finding the high potential candidates from Kaggle. So we, def we define a custom search engine in a way that we are able to extract information from a user level that we have the handler and we should be able to find exactly who the user is. We also worked on a lot of refinements on, on the users, what we are finding. Like if we want to find user from a specific geographical location, we can do that. If we want to find user from a specific diversity uh, pillar, we can do that. Uh, we also build on the research gate, another gate, great place to find like good research uh, candidates. Uh, this is where we, again, were able to extract the uh, user profile rather than the discussions. We provide a refinement of defining, like finding users from top CS grad programs in the world, like the MID, the Stanford, CMUs of the world. We were also uh, able to provide another refinement or research gate on the basis of diversity standpoint. Again, like there are nine other different channels, including GitLab, GitHub, like most of the time, like GitHub is there, but like, how do you, like, how do you take your recruiting or sourcing to the next level from just a user profile finding, has he contributing, like what exactly, like, uh, is this person, where exactly is this person located? How do I find his email address to reach out? Can I relate this GitHub profile to any other social profiles available? Can I relate this GitHub profile to a LinkedIn profile? So we, we were able to accomplish all this and I'll show you in a second how we did that also. Again, Google Scholar, Behance, uh, because one of the other biggest need from a, from a network standpoint is like finding a lot of cool designers. So we were able to create, like provide some magic on Behance uh, custom search engine to find candidates. Facebook uh, with the uh, recent debacle of the graph search because of the Cambridge Analytica case, like how do you find candidates for uh, Facebook? So this is where we, I think I've probably spent most of my time among out of these resources, the nine resources listed on the slide, but we were able to like uh, read the HTML in the inspect code and able to figure out like how do we find uh, the users which we are really going after. Plus diversity is always one of the biggest focus area for any companies or like even at PL or PL network. We were able to define just another search engine specifically focusing on finding candidates like women or Hispanic candidates or African-American. And you can provide any sort of a refinement on that. Like if you want, I want an African-American candidate from this location, from these colleges, all these refinements are available. Now, if you talk about like all these, these are all separate, separate custom search engine. And we like, rather than giving somebody like 10 or 15 search engines, why don't we combine the functionality of all search engine into one toolkit? Kitty, if you can go to the next slide. So this is where we, this is just an example how to configure the custom search engines. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is how we did the GitHub parsing. Like we were able to find candidates from there. We were able to locate the profile. And from there on the right-hand side, we got all his social profiles, including email addresses. Uh, next slide, please. This is the toolkit we created. It's a website, a pretty simple website we created on Google slide. All the custom search engines are available there. So. Uh, everything is housed in one place. And as I said, like we are probably gonna add another 20 more resources. So it's publicly available for anybody to use. We kept it really simple in a way that it's not just a recruiting professional can use it. Anybody even outside of recruiting should be able to click and find candidates. Next slide. We know we talked about OSNIG and image searching. This is how we solve the problem where we use the algorithm behind the two biggest search engines available in the market today right now. And we were able to find totally different set of candidates for a, for one search string. So if you talk about increasing your productivity, like you can 2X your productivity right away. Like if you see the results on left and results on right are totally different. Next slide, please. Uh, it is not finished. We have a lot of things to do right now. Like one of the uh, other thing which we really wanted to go after is the mapping. Uh, we are looking into solutions. Like we know like solutions available on the skill, talent and company and industry, but how do we co combine all those things into one toolkit? Is that what we are working on right now? Uh, we are also working on like sorting out our ways to find candidates from Discord and Telegram because we just don't want to blast positions there. 
rather than how can we just uh, potentially recruit and go directly to the users. And the last two things, we're out of time here, but um, the recruiting team's already doing some amazing um, innovative approaches to this stuff. And uh, just to highlight a couple of things you'll see in Lisbon, um, Davis is running a Friends of PL recruiting event. Um, the idea being, can we bring talented people together, not in, an, in a specific event related to recruiting, rather in, um, you know, it's kind of a networking thing or um, promoting the PL network and then from there attracting candidates. And one of the ongoing conversations that Ravi and I had and is going on in the recruiting team is how can we incentivize members of the PLN to um, encourage their connections to join? I think we're out of time. Thanks for right. uh, your patience. <laughs> awesome. Okay, next up we have Koi, uh, which will be talking about DAGs with decentralized identity uh, and IPFS and Web3.storage. Hey folks, um, if anybody's watching that doesn't know me, I'm Alex from Koi. Uh, I will, I suppose, share my screen and I can click through it. That's okay. There you go. Great. Um, sorry, we're at a conference this week, so most of the team's unavailable, unfortunately, but uh, I'll give you guys a quick once over. And there's also a quite lengthy uh, technical video here at the end that Raj made. So if anybody wants to see all the details of how to deploy a core task and what the kind of intricacies look like under the hood, uh, we can go through that as well. Or it's probably, it's pretty long for this. So if anybody wants to watch it themselves, I'll drop a link into the chat. Um, so the general idea here was uh, we have a faucet for Koi that we've been using for a while, and we wanted to make it a little bit more, um, number one, user-friendly to give people sort of an identity after they come out of the faucet. So we wanted to assign a DID so that they have something that they can continue using as they work with Koi in the future. Um, we wanted to store that on IPFS and have all the attestations live on IPFS without any uh, on-chain smart contract anywhere. So the whole thing runs on a Koi task, as we call them, uh, which is sort of a um, bespoke consensus network that you can write in JavaScript. Uh, and the data for this um, kind of DID system that we've created all lives kind of like a DAG on IPFS. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that this was fully decentralized. So while we're using web3.storage, uh, we've configured that as a default within Koi tasks. So when somebody runs a Koi task node and they select this particular task, they'll be prompted to create an API key for web3.storage, uh, which hopefully will drive some users their way, uh, but also means that anybody who's writing a task uh, can then kind of use that as a de facto way of storing things. Um, so all of the uh, tasks that people write in the future will hopefully take advantage of the fact that many of our nodes will have these web 3 storage keys. Um, and that should mean that lots of stuff will end up getting uploaded to IPFS. Uh, in the future too, we'd like to open this up to the standards so people can use it uh, for a variety of other things related to kind of other Filecoin projects. Uh, we'll probably publish the, uh, the full DID spec as well. So it's nice and easy for people to use. Um, just to give it a quick once over of how the faucet kind of works, uh, there's sort of two main steps here. The first one is uh, people have to to get assigned a DID. And the second part is that once they have the DID, they have to get attestations to prove that they have, uh, say, a Twitter account or a phone number or an email connected to it. Um, that last part is the most important because that's how we prove that they're human. Um, and that's sort of why we can actually issue tokens from our faucet. Um, and one of the other big things kind of under the hood here is that Koi's uh, attention tracking game also uses these DIDs as a spam prevention mechanism. Uh, so we previously had these deployed on our weave. It looks like the cost basis is a lot lower due to some Filecoin, so we'll probably be using Filecoin in the future for this. Um, but yeah, uh, without further ado, essentially uh, how this goes, we explained this in the first one, but we have our user, uh, Miley, let's imagine Miley Cyrus comes through Launchpad and she wants to get um, approved for the DID. She comes and gets a DID. Uh, it's just kind of issuing something and putting it onto IPFS. Once that's up there, then um, people can start issuing uh, attestations to her or she can request an attestation. So one way to request an attestation would be saying, uh, I want to verify my Twitter handle. So I'll post something on Twitter, say a little hash or something that's a unique signature. And then people can go and verify that her Twitter has that hash on it and they can issue attestations, except they won't do it personally. They'll do it automatically using their coin node. Um, and so lots of these coin nodes can also be configured to have an API key for Twitter. Um, and so one API key for Twitter, one for web3.storage, and they create that attestation, upload it to web3.storage, and then submit that to one of the task nodes to kind of click everything together, and then it gets added into our index tag. Um, so we started building this out. Uh, the faucet's now under construction. Uh, it has been for a while, actually, but now that we've got the DID standard pretty much together, uh, it's going to take a bit of an upgrade. Um, so the way this will work is that every time that someone verifies a new form of identity, they'll get more tokens from the faucet. Um, so the first thing that they do, uh, say it's Twitter, will give them their first one token. Uh, once they get that one, the next one will give them double that. And then every time that they add another attestation, they'll have double. 
Um, we're hoping to add a lot more beyond this, but to start with Twitter, Discord, uh, email, and phone will be the main ones. Email and phone, we're going to be doing from Koi because uh, it's kind of hard to decentralize those at the moment, but uh, gradually we're hoping to add more and more types of verification here that can kind of increase what people are doing. Um, and for example, if Launchpad wanted to attest that certain people have been through Launchpad, they could issue an attestation following the same framework, and that would kind of give people a little bit more of a verified identity and proof of humanness. And we can probably add some reputation specs for that so that their attention is worth more in Koi. Um, Again, all of this gets stored on IPFS via Web3 storage, and yeah, this is most of it. Um, here's a quick overview of what the uh, actual DAG structure for this looks like. So you basically got a whole bunch of these little uh, signed payloads. We'd never built a DAG before, uh, so this is kind of our hacked together implementation. We'll probably continue refining the process over time. Um, the general concept, though, is that each of these little uh, snippets of JavaScript here for non-technical people are little payloads getting up to IPFS, and each one of them are signed by somebody that's submitting them. So the first one gets signed by you as the user. Um, you generate a key, sign your DID with that key. That gets uploaded via one of the Koi task nodes, so you don't even have to worry about talking to IPFS or Filecoin. Someone's, someone else is going to make sure that it gets uploaded because there's a second incentive model for them. So they're going to earn some Koi tokens for running their node. And if their node completes a bunch of these registration uploads, then their node's going to get more points um, towards getting a reward uh, every 12 hours. Um, if they want to do something like change that DID, then they're going to update a, a diff. So say I wanted to add a username to my account, I would submit a new one like this. And as long as it's got the same signature, then we can kind of aggregate all this together. Um, then what the Koi task nodes are going to do in order to maintain this index is they're going to keep a list of all of the payloads that have been submitted. And they're going to basically compute an output of that to give you the latest version of the DID, uh, which is what our uh, the API that we provide will show. Um, and so this, this output DID doesn't actually exist anywhere as a complete payload, but the nodes know how to reconstruct it because they're all sort of playing the same game and they're fighting to create this index faster to get the rewards. Um, and so they're all kind of ongoing, uh, on an ongoing basis, they're all trying to compute this index and submit a hash of the index. And so this allows us to continuously update the index without worrying that anything's being left out. Um, because if there's a new payload that's updated or uploaded to IPFS and it's not in the index, then that node won't be able to get the reward. Um, so each one's always trying to find more payloads that are signed by that user. And if they're not signed by the user and they end up in the index, then the node gets audited and we take away their stake. Um, as for the attestations, they work kind of the same way. Uh, so as the owner of my DID, I can request an attestation, say for Twitter. Uh, so I submit one of these payloads. Once that's up there, then somebody else can go and fulfill it. Or rather, the task node will see the request, and task nodes will all kind of scurry to go and query Twitter, grab the data from my account, make sure that the hash that I posted to Twitter actually lines up with my account ID and everything. And if it's successful and it follows the proper process, then they'll submit one of these attestation payloads, which goes into the task nodes again, and they add that into the index. And then finally, there's a master index that sits on top of all of this. Um, and so the cool thing about this that's really neat is that instead of having all of this live in a smart contract that would be on Ethereum or Polygon or something like that, uh, this master index basically is just one hash that gets updated once a day. Uh, so it increases the throughput for something like this a lot compared to trying to do everything in a smart contract. But you still have a lot of the kind of verification and trustlessness that we would expect from decentralized systems. Um, so there's a lot of like kind of this is why we set up Coitas in the first place. But I think uh, IPFS is going to be a really good area for us to work on this with, and we're going to hope to publish a lot of these as standards so that other people can follow this design process and make good use of the system. Um, yeah. So uh, just to quickly uh, show how that works, I think we had this this slide was in there before. Um, you have a desktop node where you run your tasks, so you just kind of click to select them, and then you set a stake to run them on your computer. Um, when you start running one of them, it's just going to look for these kind of outstanding things that are happening, pull that data down, upload it into IPFS, do all that stuff. Um, there's a configuration screen in here as well that you use to set your API keys like web3.storage, and we have some prompts. So when you go to run a new task, it requires a web3.storage API key. It'll give them a little like, link to say, hey, here's how you go set one of those up. Um, and there's some console outputs here. Uh, main thing being this uh, get request in Postman is pretty hard to read from here, but basically there's an API on each one of these nodes that's going to allow people to query the node itself and ask for the data about the DID user. Um, and so we're kind of clustering these together and we're working on some routing uh, technologies as well. It'll sit on top of this to make it even more useful. Um, I guess uh, last thing to show would be over here, you've got the uh, different kind of endpoints that are supported. So each user or each uh, node will open up a register endpoint. Um, It'll also have the ability to list the IDs based on their ID, uh, give attestations, and see lists of pending attestations, all that kind of stuff. So just all these little nodes running around trying to upload things to IPFS and verify them and that kind of thing. Uh, so more to come on this. Uh, I will drop the video in here because it's quite long. Um, so if anybody wants to watch that, give it a shot and let us know what you think. All right.
Great. Next up, we have Chris, who will be talking about uh, Phil Plus program uh, infographics from Growth Marketing. Yep. yep. Can you share your screen, Katie? That'd be right. I'll be really quick, guys. Um, we, <clears throat> we've been working on, um, so, so my team is really focused around storage provider uh, awareness, attracting more storage providers into our ecosystem and ensuring that they have all the information they need, right, uh, before they come into the ecosystem, before they get too in-depth in the conversations. And one of the topics that, that they're always asking about uh, as top of mind is, is the Phil Plus program. Can you go to the next slide, please, Katie? So what we did is we uh, reached out to a vendor that I used to work with when I was uh, in, in previous roles, different companies um, called CPR Interactive uh, out of the Bay Area. And they do a really good job of creating um, really, really uh, easy to understand um, infographics for, for one of the things they do anyway. They do other things too. But the point is, is that they were um, able to learn about all about our Field Plus program and put it into an interactive infographic uh, these are just screenshots right now of what you would see if you if you look at the simple graphic on uh, your phone or your tablet, and it really it, it really easy to see here, right? You click you click the button, the plus button, and it opens up a more detail about each particular um, reward or uh, you know incentive that they have as a storage provider. Um, if you go to the next slide, I can show you more what the interactive inter interactiveness of this will be. Can you click on that link there? Is there the the, the graphic should be linked, Katie? Inside that graphic, yeah, right there. And the password is all lowercase vision, the word vision. And then you will be able to click here, guys. You'll be able to, at the very, scroll down a little bit and you'll be able to play this animation. Scroll down a little bit more. I'm sorry, further down, right there. There you go. It's already, so now you can see what's, what's happening is as the um, user comes to this page, we're asking them to click step-by-step uh, and understand what a data owner does, what a notary's role in this whole process is, and what storage providers are going to do. Scroll down just a little bit long, a little bit right there. There you go. And hit play again. There you go. Um, and so it's going to show in an interactive manner what actually happens. Um, don't You don't have to click anything. It's going to do it all by itself. It's just a video recording is all it is. But what this infographic uh, will allow um, users to do, visitors to do, is to actually see what are all the steps that happen in a Field Plus program and how the storage provider gets block rewards um, as a result of all this. And so we're hoping that this just increases the understanding of new potential storage providers onto the network. And that's it. I told you I'd be really fast. All right. I have a feeling some of the, uh, this might be added to the Launchpad curriculum very shortly. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, great job. So next we have Sean who will be talking about uh, long haul testing on Filecoin proofs. Perfect. Um, hi, so my name's Sean. Um, I work on the Filecoin proofs team. So uh, we're, we um, maintain the library, which does all the uh, proofs for Lotus and Filecoin. So uh, ceiling, proof of space time, uh, proof of replication. I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, right, so the BuildBlock project um, was a project that previously existed when I joined the team. Um, I was tasked with um, figuring out ways to improve the way it was run. Um, so as I said previously, um, this does some long haul testing of uh, sector ceilings, as well as like proof of replication, proof of space time, making sure um, those uh, parts of the code are robust. Um, so there are a few problems with what we were doing. Um, one, one problem was uh, tests can take several hours to complete um, and they require really expensive server hardware. Um, so the problem there was a lot of uh, native cloud solutions um, have limitations on the hardware they can run on, um, how long that you can actually use their container-based or virtualized solutions if you're running on, um, say, Circle CI. Um, the other problem was, uh, contrary to that, to get around it, um, the tests were running on servers in the protocol labs data center. Um, and they had to be deployed as scripts. Um, they're hard to monitor. They had to, um, had to set up our own um, sort of orchestration in order to, to pass back test results or notify us of test failures. Um, so, so a lot of manual plumbing that had to be built, a lot of scripts, a lot of cron jobs and everything, a lot of um, crawling through logs on the server. Um, 
in order to, to analyze test failures. Um, the solution which I proposed was to orchestrate everything using a feature um, on major cloud platforms um, called self-hosted runners. So basically what the self-hosted runner is, is you install their agent um, on your server. Um, and that just handles communicating back with the uh, cloud-based um, uh, solutions uh, infrastructure. So, so basically you install their agent, you can do all your orchestration, scheduling of tests and everything on the, in one centralized um, location. So the benefits of that is you don't have to build your own notification mechanisms, you don't have to build your own UI. Um, and you can also use their easy to use format, which is basically like one document, like all your tests can be just defined in one YAML file. Um, and basically take take advantage of a, a centralized location for everything. Um, so the next slide um, shows kind of the one slide demo of the um, user experience here or developer experience. Um, so this, is, so this is like a, a demo of the test runs. So this is actually um, at the top level on GitHub here, you can see we can just have our badges and those badges can be um, you know, placed on any web page. In this case, this is the, um, this is displayed from our GitHub repo for the file claim proofs project. Um, so you can see here, there's one badge which is passing, and then we see there's a failure here on this other Circle CI. So uh, basically, for a developer or someone in the community, they want to see the health of the project. They go ahead and click on this. Um, it jumps through to um, the Circle CI dashboard. Um, we can see there's a test failure in the second one where. Um, so these are the three jobs that are running. We have a memory leak job, which actually runs on um, cloud-based um, container, um, which is doing uh, basic memory leak testing on file claim proofs library, making sure it's not wasting memory somewhere and it's cleaning up after itself. Um, the second two tests there, the GPU test and CPU test are actually um, offloaded to um, our data center. Um, where they're running, one's running on a, a GPU-based server with an NVIDIA Tesla card, the other one's running on a strictly CPU-based um, test doing um, all of our ceiling tests. Um, so you can see on this second one, there's a failure in the GPU test. Um, and you just click through to that. Um, and then you can see all the tests that ran. So you can see in, in this um, third graphic, um, the uh, test durations that I was talking about previously, like our um, life cycle test for a 32 gig. Um, the second one down is a nine hour runtime. Um, and then a, a bit further before we can see it, it failed, there was a failure, which is why the badge is showing up red in the 64 gig test. Um, and you can see if you expand that um, in the logs, the, the circle there, it's seen the actual failure was the, the device ran out of um, storage space, which wasn't a failure in the test itself. Um, but it's, it's really easy just with a few mouse clicks using this. Um, you get a top level um, where you see some things are green or red failing. Um, you can click through, open the logs up, everything's nicely formatted. Um, so uh, everything can be centralized, also email notifications if something fails. Um, so, so much easier to orchestrate things than um, ha having uh, tests that are individually deployed to individual servers. And for next steps around this, we're um, looking at using IPFS for some of these large file stores. So a lot of these are 64 gig parameter files that need to be moved around. Um, so we want to try dog fooding um, our own tech to actually handle, handle our intermediate file storage for a lot of the bigger um, parameter files that, that we're using here. That's all I got. All right, great. Uh, so now we have FVM Forum with Matt and Zach, um, and I believe Zach will be presenting. Zach, would you like me to keep sharing my screen or would you like to share yours? Yeah, you can keep sharing it. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, fantastic presentation so far. It's been exciting to see how everyone grew from uh, when we all met in Palo Alto. It's pretty, uh, pretty inspiring. But um, yeah, so I'm Zach. I, I work part of uh, as part of the FEMDX team. Um, Matt is also working here, um, and Sarah. So that's the full uh, FEMDX team so far. And if you kind of missed the Q and A, or you know need to get caught up on what FEM is, it's the Filecoin Virtual Machine. 
and it allows developers to create smart contracts or external actors and deploy them onto the Filecoin blockchain to run and have access to uh, actors as a need or um, not actors, but um, <clears throat> storage contracts as a uh, native primitive. And uh, next slide, please. Um, so currently, um, the you know FVM and FEVM, which is a runtime on top of the FVM that's Ethereum compatible, um, are in development. And most of the developers who have questions, they go on Slack. Uh, Slack is terrible for discoverability. So a lot of people come in and ask the same couple of questions over and over again. Um, so um, in turn, before docs, we want to have a place where developers can go in, ask questions, and also read other people's questions uh, to kind of prevent all of this extra noise from occurring. Um, and so the solution we have is just to create a forum, right? Um, a place where people can post topics. Um, very similar to uh, the discourse forums that IPFS already kind of had. Um, and again, this is kind of a precursor to docs. So we're going to use the information and the questions and the articles that are being written on the forum to guide what information we want to have on the FEM docs when they get released. Um, next slide, please. So it's already live. There's already some content on there. We even have uh, some external content on there, which is exciting. And a lot more is about to come up online. Um, we're kind of waiting for the iron release of FEM, which should be next week, hopefully. And that um, allows uh, Ethereum JSON RPC capabilities. So um, people will be able to go into Remix, write code in Solidity, and deploy straight to the Wallaby testnet. Um, so yeah, and currently you can check it out right now. Anyone here can go there, ask questions about um, the Filecoin virtual machine at fvm.discourse.group. It's a temporary URL for now. We're going to try to get a more official uh, Filecoin.io URL and have that. But um, yeah, please, if you have any questions about the FEM at all, go there, ask it. I'm sure a million other people have it and it'll be great to see some content in there. Um, next slide, please. So this is kind of um, a basic doc we're using right now to organize our content. Uh, as you see, there's a lot planned and we're kind of prioritizing it based on you know, first principles first, explainers. As the iron release comes out, we'll have a, a little bit more demos around deploying to Wallaby, as that'll be a lot more developer friendly as than it is now. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of where we're going um, with content. Uh, next slide, please. So there's some some other uh, future plans. Is again, we're going to move it to a more official URL. Right now, we're thinking fvm.slash/form.filecoin.io to keep it as a subdomain. Uh, within the filecoin.io domain. Um, we want to link to it in the file, uh, the FEM, you know, uh, homepage. So that way developers can go to this homepage. They see everything they need to go to. And eventually again, docs will also be on there. That's uh, kind of part of this whole grand plan. Um, we want to get more community curated content. So after this presentation and, um, this show me what you got. We'll be going and announcing it on the Slack channel that's open to the public and hoping to get some more of those like Foundry developers and stuff uh, creating content on these forums. And uh, maybe some more um, integration with Slack and Discord. Um, that's really it for the, uh, the FEM forums. Uh, again, please, if you have any questions or you know anything about FEM, go there first um, and ask it there. And uh, me, Matt, or Sarah will be happy to to come in and help out. And if there's any questions, uh, feel free. All right. And also shout out to Dragon who came and spoke to this cohort about uh, FEM and some of the stuff coming up in their future roadmap as well. Next up, we have Walid uh, who will be talking about Bakiao and monitoring can monitoring Canary. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Katie. Uh, so yeah, I'm Walid. I'm one of the engineers in uh, the cloud team working on uh, compute over data. 
so if you go to the next slide, uh, Baclahow is a uh, network that allows users to submit jobs that gets executed, computation jobs that get executed on a, uh, a trustless network of nodes. So uh, uh, a job that gets orchestrated, uh, nodes can bid for job execution, some bids gets rejected, accepted, and the end result is made available to the caller uh, uh, using IPFS. Uh, Backlog is still under development, it's still a new network with very limited traffic. And what we're missing today is uh, a way to continuously monitor and test uh, the network, test the different APIs that Backlog provides. I would like to have uh, visibility whenever there is any degradation in terms of availability performance <clears throat> or anything else that can go wrong. Uh, so what I've been working on is a canary that uh, continuously run different test scenarios on the different APIs that we have. And uh, what we have today is a canary that publishes metrics, uh, dashboards and trigger alarms whenever these metrics reach uh, certain defined thresholds and also integrated these alarms with the Slack channel that publishes a notification uh, to a dedicated channel uh, subscribed by the operators and the maintainers of the project or whoever wants to join and uh, interested in knowing the health of the service. So if we go to the next slide and uh, what the canary is under the hood, uh, too fast, yeah. Yeah, so the canary is implemented using AWS uh, Lambda. Uh, so we have different Lambda functions and each one of them is uh, running specific test scenario, whether that scenario is testing certain APIs, such as listing the job, submitting a new job, or describing a job, or testing the same API with different scenario, uh, different configurations, such as submit with and without concurrency. Uh, the Lambda function call back the network, uh, submit the job, or call the API, and then publish metrics about that specific execution. Uh, these metrics include, include the latency, uh, the success and failure rate. Uh, this allows us to build a dashboard, create alarms, and uh, these alarms uh, in eventually integrate with, with Slack channel. Uh, if we go to the next slide and we see the end result is uh, we have on the left-hand side, this is our Canary dashboard that monitors the, uh, we have different uh, graphs for different APIs or different uh, test functions. And on the right-hand side is our Slack uh, channel where we get notified whenever the alarm is triggered and again, whenever the alarm is, uh, is back to normal. And uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, what I wanna call out is that the project is uh, usable. Uh, the whole code is implemented, uh, including the infrastructure, We're using infrastructure as code, uh, We're using AWS CDK to create the whole infrastructure and uh, also comes with the code pipeline, uh, utilizing AWS code pipeline to, uh, to automatically build and continuously build any changes in the Canary. This includes changes in your resources, such as adding a new alarm, changing the dashboard, modifying your threshold, all that gets automatically deployed, as well as your Lambda functions, uh, adding a new test scenario or changing your implementation of the test scenario. And the project is fairly documented in our GitHub repo. So if somebody wants to, is interested in implementing Canary for to monitor their service, please do reach out, I'm happy to help. Um, and finally, a general recommendation is that most teams, they invest in implementing integration testing that or test cases that only gets executed on demand. Whenever you have a new release, a new deployment gets executed and that's it. And that is, we're missing a lot of value here in the sense that it, with, with slight modification of refactoring or with proper use of dependency injection, it should be fairly feasible to have the exact same test suite run in both environments, running on demand as part of your release pipeline. And at the same time, the same test suite run continuously and periodically uh, as a canary, uh, hitting your production uh, network or testing network or whatever different uh, stages that you have in your pipeline. That's it. All right, thank you so much. Uh, next up, we have Juan who's going to be talking about uh, gas consumption in the Filecoin network. Unfortunately, Hello, Juan had a, a 15 hour flight delay. Uh, so they went ahead and recorded. Um, so we'll take a couple of minutes and watch that. I am a research slash data scientist from the Crypto Econ Lab, and today I will be presenting my Launchpad project entitled Analysis, Modeling, and Simulation of Gas Consumption in the Filecoin Network. So let's get to it. 
Recall that the Filecoin network utilizes an EIP 1559 like mechanism in the sense that the total amount of gas consumed by a message is given by the product of a base fee measured in fill per gas unit times the number of gas units spent. Here, the base fee is adjusted dynamically according to the following equation. Here, B sub T represents the base fee at an epoch T, G sub T represents the gas consumption at an epoch T, and G star represents the target block size, which is taken as half of the maximum of the block space. Given that in periods of high congestion the base fee increases, miners are incentivized to either send less messages or wait for the network to decongest, as otherwise they would consume a larger amount of gas, and similarly, this same mechanism incentivizes miners to include more messages when the network is decongested. Furthermore, this mechanism makes the network resilient against spam attacks. Given that the network load increases during spam attacks, maintaining full block of spam messages for an extended period of time becomes impossible for an attacker due to the increasing base. Thus, if at a given epoch the gas consumption G is smaller than the target gas consumption G star, we say that the network is not congested and as such, the base fee at the next block decreases. Conversely, if the gas consumption is higher than the gas target, then the network is congested and the base fee increases. Clearly, understanding the behavior of BFT as a dynamic process is important for modeling and testing different mechanisms in the network. There is a caveat, however, and it is that the gas consumption process, capital G sub T, is in itself a random process depending on several unobservable quantities, such as demand, which are difficult to model or even measure. This, in turn, makes modeling and analyzing G sub T, and hence the base fee B sub T, non-trivial tasks. Motivated by this, the aim of this project is to, first, obtain key insights on the statistical behavior of gas consumption in the network, second, to develop probabilistic data-driven models for this gas consumption, and third, to develop a toolset to simulate this behavior in the hopes that it can be used for other projects in research or the wider ecosystem. To do this, we analyze gas consumption on an epoch-to-epoch -epoch basis, as well as on a message-by-message -message basis. To achieve this, we use Sentinel in order to query historical chain data recorded at every epoch from July 22nd to August 22nd, 2022. This corresponds to over 88,000 data points. In particular, we focus on the following data models on Sentinel. First, derived gas outputs, which is a database that contains gas data related to the execution of a message. We also utilize the dataset Message Gas Economy, which contains aggregate gas data across messages over an epoch and we use the parse messages and chain consensus datasets, which provide some additional relevant data related to the chain. Let us now present some key insights from our analysis. The link to the full report is presented at the end of this video. For simplicity, we will focus our modeling in this normalized expression for gas consumption, V tilde, as we can also write the equation for the base fee dynamics in terms of it. From here, a positive value of G tilde represents high gas usage, meaning that the network was congested, and conversely, a negative G tilde means low gas usage, signaling that the network was decongested. We begin by examining the statistical behavior of the gas dynamic. Here, we plot the time series of G tilde in the top left, its histogram in the top right, its autocorrelation function, a measure of how strongly correlated G tilde is as a time series in the bottom left, and its empirical distribution function at the bottom right. From here, one can infer that it is more likely to have periods of high congestion, as shown by the peak in the histogram as well as on the time series, since it is not as often close to negative one as it is to one. And in addition, this autocorrelation plot suggests that there's a weak correlation between measurements of G tilde, suggesting that roughly the random process G tilde becomes statistically independent of its history every five or so epochs. If we look at the periods of very high and very low congestion, and look at the distribution of the time between these periods, we can see that their distribution can be well approximated as an exponential distribution, each with their different rate, as shown in the figure. In particular, by fitting an exponential distribution to these times with high congestion and low congestion, it can be inferred that high congestion peaks happen roughly every 25 blocks, and similarly, low congestion peaks tend to happen on average every 50 or so blocks. The fact that high congestion peaks happen twice as often as low congestion peaks also agrees with the proportion of the time where G tilde is in a high and low demand or low congestion state measured as 4% and 2% of the time, respectively. We were also able to infer that the gas consumption process seems to be invariant with respect to small scales. In the figures, we plot the process G tilde observed every 10 epochs, corresponding to 5 minutes, on the top, and to 120 epochs, corresponding to an hour, at the bottom. Notice that their statistical properties stay fairly similar across these timescales. We were also able to infer that the gas consumption process seems to be invariant with respect to small scales. In the figures, we plot the process G tilde observed every 10 epochs, corresponding to 5 minutes, 
on the top and to 120 epochs corresponding to an hour at the bottom. Notice that their statistical properties stay fairly similar across these time scales. We now shift our attention to the gas consumption by message. On the left, we plot in log scale for visibility the average block proportion of a given message. Here, we group the messages into two categories as either a control plane message in blue or a data plane message in orange. On the right, we plot the mean proportion of these groups. As we can see, the control plane messages dominate the block space, as they can be up to a couple of orders of magnitude larger than the data plane ones. On average, data plane messages account for about 5% of the gas spend, while control plane messages account for the remaining 95%. Here, we present the top 10 messages per gas consumption. If you're familiar with the inner workings of Filecoin, you probably won't be too surprised to see that the top three messages are proof commit sector, pre-commit sector, and submit window proof of storage. These three messages make up for about 87% of the average gas consumption. Looking at the correlation plot among these top 10 messages, there does not seem to be any strong correlation among them, except for the mild statistical correlation for the previously mentioned degree. Can we use this data to come up with mathematical models to simulate the gas consumption? The answer is yes. In fact, we came up with several models of increasing mathematical sophistication, ranging from histogram sampling to Markov chains to classic processes in order to recreate the random behavior of the gas process. Here, we show the time series and histograms for the simulated data for different models, both at the block level, shown at the top, and at the message level, shown at the bottom. Notice how the histograms and time series of the top plots resembles those of the measured data quite well. These histograms here, again, resembles those that we were showing at the beginning. We also used advanced statistical methodologies, such as heat and market models, in order to model the unobservable demand process that drives the gas consumption up or down. Here, we fitted such a model to identify five possible demand states of very low, low, medium, high, and very high demand. Once such a model has been fit, one could use the results from it to simulate both demand and gas process as shown in the figures at the bottom. Here, there's the process that jumps from each of those five demand states. This talk was heavily condensed from the report shown in the first reference. We're currently working towards publishing a Python package with the modeling codes in the hopes that they can be of use to the wider community. If you're curious about it, however, you can DM me for more info. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Okay, next up we have a marketplace for SPs, which is really exciting. Uh, would you like me to keep sharing my screen or would you like to present? Uh, you can share your screen, fine, Katie. All right. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so the problem we're solving is, you know, I'm from the SP and clients team um, on the ecosystem growth side. So like the problem we have right now is that uh, we're getting a lot of feedbacks from the um, search providers is that they do not know where is the one stop shop to get all the resources or information they need to look for, you know, what program we have or the lenders or like vendors or any, you know, like resources that are available in the market because um, every time we go to meet up in person, but like, oh, we list out there's new program coming up, they take a photo, but they're not really going back to track, you know, like what's going on or how to uh, join them. So that's the kind of pain point um, for search providers and also client side as well. So um, I'm listening here, the problem we're solving is that uh, we wanna make sure everyone can find everything that ecosystem related in one place. Second of all, we're making sure SPs can start and grow by having one stop shop place to um, getting the resource they need. How does it work? So from um, realistically, uh, we're thinking creating a place uh, involving, you know, like all the PMs with their products and also solution builders and vendors, and then also make it easy for them can uh, be able to add their uh, um, program or products or, um, uh, uh, resources by filling out the application uh, in the marketplace, but it's going to be approved and uh, validated by uh, the PL team. And um, the opportunity, like again, um, I mentioned earlier, is to create a marketplace, I could say like a website as well for SPs to get in a resource and uh, program or vendors in the ecosystem. Um, next slide, please. So this is the first version, the software our, um, architecture that we have in mind. Um, basically, it's a place that including um, program ABC, um, vendors XYZ, or you know, like could be different solutions. But um, 
we're going to direct to uh, DSPs and uh, clients by their size. For example, we have Screenshot, Evergreen, um, or even Moon Landing, you know, based on the SP current size or their goal, we can lead them to the um, programs or resources that they're fitting. And from there, we can also lead into the each individual website or each individual landing page for each program. That's the um, idea. Uh, but, you know, in the meantime, also we realize um, compared to SPs, the clients have the similar needs, not exactly the same because for resource size, they're not using the exact same resources. Um, but um, at the end, you know, they need to be meet up each other. Like a uh, search provider is uh, storing the data for clients and clients is looking for search providers for storing their data. So um, for the next slide, please. We had a conversation with data onboarding team as well um, a few weeks ago. Uh, so we decided uh, we we're, were having a conversation going. It's like besides SP side, you know, there's a potential we can literally collaborate together with the client's team, which is uh, Shilling and Jaws team. Like uh, we have our main website uh, launching right now. It's the spfalcon.io. Um, if you guys have time, you can jump on it. And there's like main resources for SP already existing over there, but there's, you know, like not including everything that they needed. So we're thinking, you know, we, instead of only for SPs, we're thinking creating a two track, uh, two track directions. One is for our search providers, which is the provider side and also the client side for storing real data based on their size could be small, medium, and large, and we direct them for multiple programs and resources and vendors. And then those are the uh, ones potential be, you know, could be listing and matching for the SPs. And also based on their needs and their goal and also their uh, qualifications, we'll be able to match the SP with the client's needs. So at the end, they can meet each other. So um, I, I um, draw the little line right here. It's like, so I'll give you an example. If there's a medium sized uh, search providers that they're willing to store data for clients and you know they're big enough and then they have the capacity, they also have the collateral to store data for clients and clients looking for um, qualified SPs to do, you know, like um, storing real data for them um, on a regular basis. Um, the system will be able to, you know, like match them and also direct them to uh, together. And then um, for beneficial, uh, part is that um, right now we have challenges to verify uh, each SPs because, you know, like there are 4,000 nodes in the ecosystem, but um, SPs could be having multiple minor IDs under uh, one SP, but there is a big challenge for us to collecting the real information and also verify who's the SPs. By this way, uh, we'll be able to, first of all, tracking, you know, who's setting up the program that want to join the marketplace. And second of all, we'll be able to, when we're matching for clients and SPs, we'll be able to tell, you know, like to validate and then verify the uh, minor IDs with the uh, SP account as well. So um, so I would say really beneficial for both sides. For the ecosystem side, we can literally see, you know, who is actually involved in this, uh, tracking who is the real SP behind, uh, behind the minor IDs. And second of all, we can actually providing clients, you know, uh, matching the right SPs for them to store real data, um, which is also um, at the end going to be improving the ecosystem growth. Um, so our next step is going to be uh, next slide, please. It's going to be first of all, we need to figure out the scope for the project. Like uh, at first, you know, we started thinking about this is a project for SPs, but we realized the client sites also need something similar. So we're thinking, oh, they should be working together either way because if one is the provider, the other one is the store. store. So like they should be working together at the end. Uh, we're thinking how to scope this project together with the client side and also break it down to uh, different phrases because um, it's, be, it's gonna take a little bit while to get to the end, uh, the final goal for marketplaces. But we might, you know, turn into like short-term solutions what could be uh, and then like next step could be uh, like, you know, like upgrade a little bit or um, for different, you know, functions like step by step instead of, you know, one stop shop and then became like a huge project. We need um, breaking down through small um, um, period to finish uh, each goal. And second of all is determine the area of ownership. Um, at this point, basically we're working on one project with uh, between two teams. So we need to clarify uh, you know, who's going to be the lead and then who is responsible for which part 
and you know how often we're going to meet weekly or uh, our bi-weekly um, how's that going to work and third is we need to define opportunities and uh, challenges as well like find out the what's the possible solutions because uh, we're thinking about matching SBN and clients uh, there's going to be a uh, couple of problems along the way, especially, you know, identifying who is SP and who is the client they should be matching with uh, by qualification. So we need to find a possible solution for multiple challenges. And uh, next one is we set up timeline and review the project uh, project like weekly basis. So um, instead of, you know, like um, uh, in order to push forward the project, we need to have more regular base, uh, um, what should I call it, working meetups or um, calls or something like to uh, push the project forward more consistently, uh, constantly. And then next one is we need to sync with the um, data owner team, which is Joel's team uh, as well, and making sure we're determining the best way how to collaborate with each other. Um, last is like uh, we still need to do the uh, complete a project proposal to the internal team. And um, like for funding wise, we need more support and also uh, finding the right team member for um, the web developer site as well. We might need to look for a third contract party or vendors to finish um, the web design. But um, yeah, I think this is a, a good step to uh, start. That's it. All right. Awesome. Next up, we have Knowledge Graphs with Alex. Hello, Alex, hello. Would you like me to keep sharing my slides, or would you like to share yours? You can you can keep sharing yours. Uh, All right. Okay, so uh, for the Pro, uh, Protocol Labs Network Knowledge Graph, we seek to enable access to integrated information uh, within and between the Protocol Labs Network members and uh, participants. Uh, the way we'll do it is, uh, is by defining and implement, implementing the structures, processes, and systems uh, necessary. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Um, OK. So the Protocol Labs network is growing, um, and we need systems to help the network scale. Um, this is uh, seen as. Uh, a lot recently where we uh, can actually find some information or connect the dots uh, of who is doing what and, and what not. So uh, as some examples, the as a member of the Autocar uh, organization, you would probably want to build system reports um, easily and, and quick, quickly. As a member of Starfleet, you would probably want to see and understand how uh, the projects um, connect and, and uh, how they align to the strategic goals of, of the organization. As a member of the spaceport team, you would probably want to quickly understand who needs help and, and quickly assist uh, those teams and founders. As a member or a participant of the Protocol Labs Network, um, you'll probably want a good view uh, of the information and, and helpful resources available to you. And another example, as a member of the network funding team, you would probably want to quickly scan for uh, valuable projects uh, that you want to support and, and would be valuable for, for the network. So to do this, um, uh, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so with that, we have a lot of information available. We have a lot of different uh, data sources, a lot of projects, a lot of uh, contributors, and, and the data comes from everywhere, and they're not always up to date and, and, and or not. So um, we have data across different platforms. So for example, we have for the visual version control, we have data on github we have some data on gitlab although this is uh, less uh, common for our ecosystem for the crm we use hubspot Airtable, notion it's all over the place uh, we use github to do that as well for communication there's 
a lot of options <laughs> that we actually use Slack, Discord, Telegram, uh, Zoom. So uh, we can we, we we have a lot of uh, scattered data around those those channels. For knowledge bases, we have uh, a lot of information in Google Docs, Notion, uh, Confluence. This is less common um, for most of us, and Coda. Um, okay, uh, with that, all the data the data available, we we uh, we gotta start thinking about how can we actually answer questions like. How do the different organizations within the, the network actually interplay and, and how they connect and how they uh, connect to the to the goals of the network? Um, which projects from the network collaborate with each other and, and for how long they've been collaborating, for example, the, those would be questions that are useful for insights and, and actually understanding where you want to go with the network and, and where uh, you're going, whether you like it or not. Uh, understanding where you're going is is helpful. Um, you can go to the next slide and uh, okay. For so, how can how can we get that uh, insights and, and and actually get that information from uh, the knowledge from from all the data? Um, the data is is all over the place, uh, like I said, and um, to do any kind of um, insights and to get in any kind of insights, we first gotta integrate that data and uh, do some reasoning around it, inferences, uh, make uh, relationships and, and whatnot. So as, as previously mentioned, we have uh, some challenges uh, when we, I want to do that because the number of platforms and services that are offered are growing exponentially and teams are using whatever is best for their work and their workflow. Um, each platform uses different APIs, different data models, different everything. So you, you gotta uh, uh, fix those, those challenges and, and, and figure out a way of fixing that. Um, Okay, so you can go to the next one. Okay, so what's what's the solution for this? Um, this is the would be the, the backend layer is the knowledge graph. So this is where the whole knowledge graph comes in. The knowledge graph is basically data with with uh, context and um, integration. So you actually uh, get the data from data sources, do some data processing and integration, uh, run some pipelines, normalization, uh, standardization, and then you would connect um, entities from different data sources to a single or, or um, common language and, and common uh, schema that you can actually uh, do some connections and and, and and understand the the relationships between the the those data data points. Um, you you then within the knowledge graph you can um, enrich that data by since you have already integrated the data you you can uh, enrich that data by using um, other data platforms and and whatnot and then you run that you expose that we. we expose the uh, knowledge graph as a GraphQL API. So you can consu consume that from the user interface. So you can build web apps or, or use integrate this data into the uh, different data platforms, build some dashboards, analytics, and whatnot. Um, OK, so you can, get, uh, can go to the next one. This is the first prototype of the, the data modeling for the graph. So it's very basic for now, but uh, you can expand with time. So you have a person that has a role and has a skill and, and maybe within a team. Um, so a person or an organization may need a service uh, and, and uh, or may need someone with 
a certain type of skill, that's where the knowledge graph can actually do some uh, run some graph algorithms to get recommendations and, and identify and match make those uh, opportunities. We can uh, also use that to uh, identify uh, collaboration opportunities uh, opportunities uh, between the network members and and whatnot. Um, and you can go to the next one. Okay, so the, the next steps for, for this would be probably a, a data platform. So you can have a user interface uh, to better manage the metadata and, and data models and schemas and whatnot. Uh, you would probably want a feature for collaboration and, and sharing those uh, data packages and, and data models. So that would be um, uh, with some type of data model forking like GitHub does. Uh, uh, we can compose uh, the graph with a federated uh, super graph that uh, can be enriched and, and, and uh, extensible to, uh, from subgraphs. And, and yeah, so, and we also would probably do some ecosystem integrations with IPLD to handle the, the data models and, and schemas and mappings and Bacalhau for data processing pipelines. Uh, and I guess that's it. I wanna thank a lot uh, the help I had from Masi and um, a lot of support and help there. And yeah, that's it. Thanks for the opportunity and, and thanks for uh, the, the odd support from the Launchpad team and, and everyone from the ecosystem. All right, awesome. Yeah, and like Lindsay said, knowing those numbers is uh, actually really incredibly helpful. So knowledge that we'll all take with us. Next up, I have Bunny Slope with Anastasia, Bryn, Caitlin, Caitlin, and Megan. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say that all of these projects so far have been like so amazing. It's like a really tough act to follow all of these incredible projects, um, but I will I will make an attempt. Um, so our project is entitled Bunny Slope. Um, the rest of my team is having a blast in NYC right now. So I'm the lone wolf here to, to present our project and I will try to do it justice. Um, so our goal with this project was to create a living resource destination for Filecoin for IPFS um, with use cases and with learning content. So um, much of our team is working with the Filecoin Foundation, um, Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web, my work with the Filecoin Green Team. Um, we're interacting a lot with people that are not um, adept in this Web3 environment and maybe don't have the knowledge that um, a lot of us in this space have, you know, even with words like decentralized, like what does that actually mean? Um, so we're interacting with a lot of people that don't have that kind of background knowledge. And I know for me and in my interactions with a lot of those types of people, I'm constantly sending links and resources. And um, so this project kind of stemmed from that need of like where we have all this information um, that on all of our resources and like we, we have so much information um, in this world and we don't really have a one good place that aggregates all of that. So that's what this project um, kind of stemmed from. Um, you know, really if Web3 wants to scale beyond and Filecoin, IPFS, all the things we're working on, if we wanna scale beyond where we're at right now, we need to enable knowledge in a really accessible, and low barrier manner. Um, so that is where Bunny Slope comes in. It is an intro to Filecoin to um, all of the different use cases that we have currently and some learning content to kind of get people's feet wet um, when it comes to this world. So next slide. Um, we first started this process by, um, this originally started as a way to aggregate case studies. A lot of the case studies and use cases for Filecoin right now were just kind of living on different blog posts um, in different PR, like press releases and um, in people's brains that are part of the Filecoin network. And so we first started by taking those case studies and aggregating them into um, a dashboard. And actually, Katie, would you mind if I share my screen just so I can kind of walk through that? Sorry. Awesome. So want to apologize for all my tabs um, in advance. Um, so 
here we go. We started by taking all of the use cases that we know of and um, aggregating them into this air table. Um, so you'll see a lot of the work that the Filecoin Foundation and Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web, a lot of the projects that they're working on, um, some of our projects that we're working with on the Filecoin Green team, um, we aggregated them into this air table and our um, hopes with aggregating them into this specific uh, like type of interface into Airtable is that we can create something that um, doesn't necessarily have to be maintained by just us, that people can come in and fill out um, this form and enter information about the project. And we can kind of keep this as like a living, breathing thing um, because it is really useful to have um, these use cases for, um, again, people that maybe don't understand what the use case could be for decentralized storage. Um, this kind of gives a really good picture of all the different work that's going into this. So um, we have short descriptions about all of the different case studies, links for more information, the status of the project. So you'll see a lot of these are still ongoing, the types of data that's stored, um, as well as the current size of data sets, which this is something that I think is really interesting, especially for me working on the environmental side of things. I want to know how much environmental data is being stored. Um, so it's really cool to kind of keep track of that and have a repo that has those things. So that is one aspect of what we worked on. Um, and then we also aggregated a bunch of onboarding resources. Again, this is for a less technical audience. Um, tons of information out there, which is amazing, but not always easily findable, accessible. Um, and the beauty with this, I personally believe, um, so this we, we took that case studies the resources that we aggregated onto that Airtable and moved them into a Notion page. And the thing that I think is the most beautiful about this is that you can kind of level, like you can kind of pick how far deep you want to go into it. Because with all of these concepts, you could spend days just like going down the rabbit hole and um, finding all this information. And with this, it's a really good intro um, and you can dig deeper and deeper and deeper. So our hope with this is that we can kind of have levels to it. So if you just want basic reading here's one resource if you want to like really dive into like a three hour long talk um, or some of the youtube videos that we have like that is another option as well so um, we took the case studies we took the resources um, from that air table and again we want to keep the air table system to kind of have this be something living and breathing um, and yeah so now we have this notion page that has some of these resources so basic definitions and information um still kind of building on this this is our, our mvp um, we have all the case studies aggregated on here um, with more information from uh, the different blog posts and again those different um, sources on that have <laughs> where they were living before on just blog posts now they're aggregated into something a little bit um, easier um, and then yeah so we also did a piece or i did a piece on the environment 101 um, because our work with filecoin green is kind of at an intersection an interesting intersection of web3 and um, the environment there's either people that know a lot about web3 or know a lot about the environment and some people that are kind of in that in between space um, so we kind of aggregated some of that information in here we have a glossary that i'm building um, that actually our team in a recent meeting was like, this would be something that would be really useful to have. And I was like, perfect, I'll throw it into my Launchpad project. Um, so again, just a really nice way to aggregate all the different projects that we're working on and all the different information for people um, to interact with it more. Um, so as far as next steps, um, we uh, need to finish just kind of cleaning up the Notion page and linking all of those resources in there. Um, and then we also want to come up with an action plan to maintain the hub um, with new up case, use cases with updating learning content. Again, we don't want this to be something that we necessarily have to like constantly be maintaining, but rather something that will be useful for everybody to um, build together. And so um, also getting that buy in from teams to keep this as a living resource. So thank All you. Right. Sorry if I went a little over. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Sergey talking about Piranha. Hi everyone. I apologize for the background noise. I have a really long morning with, with the late flights to NYC. So can you hear me well? Um, yes. All right. Okay. If, if you can share the slides, please. There you go. Yeah. So my project is called Organizing Knowledge Sharing uh, for Filecoin Community. 
Um, I'll, I'll just start with observation how the knowledge is being shared and managed in Filecoin community today. And it's not, it, it, it applies not only to Filecoin, this is what we're observing for majority of the Web3 projects today, is that um, most of the community knowledge between the members is exchanged in various messengers like Discord, Telegram, and Slack. Um, so Filecoin has Slack, Protocol Labs has Slack, uh, there's a Discord channel for Protocol Labs Network. There's some Telegram channels related to Filecoin. So all of those communities kind of communicating together in those siloed channels that are not searchable. Uh, all the knowledge stored there is not structured and it's not curated by the community. Basically, it's not really usable, but uh, those channels store lots and lots of information. And to give you one reference, we did analysis of uh, Filecoin Slack channel and we found 380 channels today. So this is this is very impressive. <laughs> um, so and why this happens? Why there's no good tool that that would solve the problem of the knowledge sharing? And we believe that there's simply no tool today that would satisfy the needs of Web3 communities that are very fast growing. Um, that are more complex than a typical organization that is providing just single product there's usually collaboration of many teams working together each team is pretty independent and the resources of that team are also kind of maintained independently so we didn't see any solution that would work well for these distributed organizations like large organizations like filecoin uh, can we go to the next slide please so and for someone who's not familiar with pirana this is our mission, is uh, to build effective knowledge base protocol specifically focused for Web3 communities. Uh, so the, the protocol itself is fully decentralized and built on blockchain and Filecoin IPFS, all of the content stored in a distributed way and owned by the community itself. And it also provides various incentives um, for the users to contribute. Like in, in form of a token that will would be launched later, um, various NFTs that are being rewarded to the users. And we are planning this awesome collaboration with a coin network to reward users with attention tokens as well. So we're trying to, to align with incentives in the WebPay communities and also following the community WebPay community's philosophy. And the most what's the most important is to satisfy the needs of the Web3 communities for knowledge sharing. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So originally we thought that we could start just a single community for web, for, for Filecoin on Piranha and just um, create an environment where resources could be stored and um, community members can come in and exchange questions, discuss things, post tutorials and so on. But we quickly realized that Filecoin organization is not as simple. We started doing our analysis on the various projects and resources within Filecoin network. And we already discovered over 200 projects and resources. So it definitely doesn't fit into one category. Uh, so after we um, created, compiled that um, list of the resources, we started thinking that they need to be broken down into categories because one single community is not enough. Like there's different teams um that are managing those projects resources and so on uh, so after we compile compiled those resources um we broke down them into categories but the way we want to break it down we want to have a hierarchy like instead of having silent separate communities we want those communities to live under one umbrella of the filecoin network okay can, can you go to the next slide please so we started building it out on, on, on our protocol already. So the way we see it, like Piranha itself is broken down into communities. So file, for Filecoin Network, we are planning a master, master community that we, we are calling basically Filecoin Network. Um, and it, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so this master community would include posts and resources from all of the communities and that is related to the Filecoin network. Like it's kind of patent level that aggregates all of the resources 
uh, that we find related uh, to the Filecoin network. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so and under that parent community, we see various categories or it's called sub communities that, um, that are dedicated to specific sub areas within the file, like Filecoin itself. Uh, IPFS, uh, various related projects to IPFS like Leap Peer to Peer, um, IPLD, uh, separate community dedicated to storage providers, community related to file. Um, all right. Um, but while we have folks joining in again, I will, uh, Sergey, if you just want to wrap up real quick. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm basically done. So the, the next step for us to finalize that. Um, changes on our site, on the protocol site, to support various levels of the communities and set up all of the resources that we created, kind of aggregate them together, populate them, and organize them into that structure. Okay, awesome. Uh, next up, uh, last but certainly not least, we have Julian, who's going to be talking about speeding up libp2p. Hi everybody. I'm Julian. Uh, I work. Uh, uh, I work uh, with the uh, lib 2 p team. So maybe all, everybody already knows that lib 2 p is the um, module that stitches things together. Um, um, do you want to present the slides? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is the piece of software or library that stitches every host together. And um, it carries the traffic of IPFS. And one sticky point of our IPFS network is that it is too slow. I mean, it's not, I mean, so um, it's not too slow, but I mean, so the speed and the latency has always been a sticky point for us. So um, the goal of this project is clear. So we want to um, reduce our latency and speed up the network. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? please? Yeah, so um, this is a high level overview of what's happening uh, in the lab P2P um, module itself when we try to establish a connection between two different nodes. So basically, um, we establish a network connection like TCP connection. And then on top of that TCP connection, we add a lot of different stuff. So the first thing we add is security because we don't want to send our traffic in clear text. So um, we want to secure traffic by encryption. So we use commonly used uh, security protocols at TOA, so noise. You can see um, uh, we have, um, we support both of them. We choose one of them uh, first. The first step is you can see the um, multi-stream selection uh, on the second ladder where what happens there is that it selects a security protocol, either uh, TOS or noise. And after that's done, we do um, security protocol handshaking. So that means we negotiate uh, encryption keys and uh, what kind of algorithm we use to, to encrypt that traffic. And after the handshake is done, we run another round of uh, multi-stream selection to do a multiplexer selection because on top of the security, we also want to reuse the connect, uh, uh, connection. We don't want to um, establish a new connection every time we want to send a traffic, send a piece of traffic between two different nodes, right? So because uh, library supports uh, different, um, oh, different applications, different modules. So for that enables us for different applications to reuse the same connection by multiplexing. So we, ex we exchange another round of um, multiplexer, multiplexer selection, and then we um, instantiate a multiplexer on top of that. So we have a, a multiplexed secured connection between two different nodes, that's what we can use. Now, we want to speed that up. So uh, the, the proposal our group had is that we, we want to collapse the um, multiplexer selection and security handshaking, which is marked by the blue shade here, 
into one step rather than two steps. So that saves us one round trip time because we save one extra um, handshaking in the marked in the uh, final two yellow um, labels, right? So we don't have to do that anymore. So if we can piggyback the mark search selection in the uh, security handshaking, we can do that. Uh, the way we do that is we um, is we make use of the early data support of some of the security protocols. Uh, in this case, it's TLS or noise. Can we go to the uh, next slides? I can show some results over there. Yeah, thank you. So um, this is what we did. Um, I um, uh, inserted the um, multiplexer selection information into the TLS and shaking. Uh, so the angled brackets started log lines is that what I what I inserted into the library to show what's happening. Uh, actually, those are not those are not actually those are not going to be in the production code and uh, just uh, for demonstration purpose here. So you can see that um, when we do TOS negotiation, we uh, have already had the information of two multiplexer choices. In this case, it's um, Mplex and Yamax multiplexers. We insert that into the security protocol um, TOS here. And uh, after that uh, is inserted, uh, the, we can see that uh, after the um, TOS negotiation is done, uh, the protocol selected here is multiplex, uh, Mplex multiplexer. Right? So you can see on the top, it's a server. Uh, it's, uh, and on, on the bottom, it's the uh, client. You can see that we can uh, select that uh, multiplex protocol on top uh, by piggybacking that into the TOS negotiation. Yeah, so um, if you think about this, um, think about the IPFS network as a geographically distributed network with thousands of nodes. And if you um, envision that you know a piece of data need to uh, traverse the network and distri get distributed to its destination, you can see that the um, end result is very noticeable back in the users because um, the um, latency reduction would be in seconds. You know, it can, uh, the user can get their data out and get a faster response here. Yeah, that's what uh, um, we had here. That's all I have. Thank you so much. All right, great job. Uh, so I won't keep you folks any longer. I know we're a couple minutes over. So congratulations, everyone. Cohort is officially launched. Uh, absolutely amazing projects and learning uh, over these past six weeks. And again, for folks who are joining async uh, because you're in Singapore, thank you so much for you know watching this later. Uh, moving forward for my residents and folks that are still here, vote please for best in show. Tell other folks to vote for best in show. Uh, we have different categories. This is a QR code. You can vote on your phones right now, uh, just like maybe some of you did voting for uh, American Idol back in the day. Uh, additionally, um, we are actually going to have a learning credential, which is really exciting, uh, a learning credential NFT. So building off of, you know, Web3 and uh, some of the themes around here, if you complete the post test, you get this learning credential. So please, please, please um, complete that and get your uh, Launchpad learning credential uh, from Certi. Uh, additionally, it is up to you now. One of the uh, best parts of Launchpad is the fact that we don't just do this alone. The reason why this program is successful is because we have a lot of folks who volunteer time and resources and knowledge uh, to support folks as they are coming into the network. So as you move forward uh, in your journey in the network, please, please, please think of ways to you know, give back and be a strong steward for Launchpad. Uh, don't forget about the time that, you know, we, uh, you know, your mentors were there to support you. Think about being one. I will uh, drop it in the chat as well to sign up to be a mentor. Our next cohort starts on Monday. So 
really soon. Uh, additionally, for those who are going to Lisbon, we will have uh, the we'll have like a launch pad social. We invite all of you to attend, uh, and we'll also be at IPFS camp as well. For my current residents, tomorrow uh, we will be revealing best in show at the retro. So please, please, please join that as well. Um, and congratulations, everyone! Thanks uh, so much. You're welcome. Awesome. All right, Great everyone. job, everybody. Yay. <laughs> yes, and a huge, huge shout out to um, the rest of the Launchpad team uh, that absolutely does a phenomenal job. So again, that's Marco, Hannah, Anal, Lindsay, and Dave, our new cohort manager, and Carla as well, who definitely keeps us all sane. So have a great day, everyone. Thanks. See you guys. Bye.